think about a voice in the wilderness, that we not only understand God's word as we are doing, but we also understand the context into which this word is being spoken, this voice in the wilderness. What kind of culture, what kind of society are we living in? And how do we build the bridges of communicating God's word into that society? Now, it's a special pleasure for me to welcome to the platform a friend, but also a very fine uh, Christian speaker and writer and broadcaster, Roy McCluffrey. Many of you know his work and will have heard him uh, in other contexts. He is the director of the Kingdom Trust and formerly director of the Shaftesbury Project. He has written many books, some of which are here at the uh, bookstore, and which I'll introduce in just a moment. He is frequently engaging in writing on a whole range of topics uh, in our society and in politics, social issues of various kinds. Uh, his recent book, Belief in Politics, which arrived in good time for the election, a series of interviews with politicians, uh, has been a bestseller in uh, many parts of the country because it is exposing the importance of Christian values in uh, the political process and what that means for politicians. He's working in the media, he's working uh, regularly in lecturing, as well as challenging us in the Christian community about our engagement in society. So it is a special pleasure to welcome you, Roy, and we're looking forward to this first lecture, which is on the state of society, and tomorrow morning at the same time, the state of the church. Let me mention these two books. One is called The Eye of the Needle, which is a call to us Christians to a prophetic engagement in society with a deep concern for God's justice and God's love. And the second is a practical guide to making some kind of impact in society. It's called taking action. Most of us long to do something but are overwhelmed by the need or bewildered by the complexity. And this introduction, taking action, is a very good guide to how we can do something. So before I welcome Roy to uh, speak to us, let us pray together. Our Father, we want to thank you that you did not shout your message from a distance, but you came to this planet as a first century Palestinian Jew, as a man, and through the incarnation you have demonstrated your deep compassion for our culture. You created culture, you created society, and you have given us the responsibility to care for it. And yet we feel, as Jeremiah did, something of the brokenness and the disorder and the fracture of the world in which we live. And so often we distance ourselves from that. And so we ask that this morning, as Roy comes to open our eyes to what is happening in the world around us, you will be amongst us, you will be with him, and by your spirit, challenge us as to the way in which we can respond to the needs of this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's welcome Roy McCluffrey. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Very kind words. Just get myself organized. Thank you very much for the invitation to come to Keswick. It's my first time uh, at Keswick and uh, I was the envy of everybody when I set off from Nottingham yesterday to come here. I was here about a couple of weeks ago doing something else. So it's my pleasure to come back and to be with you this morning to tackle this subject which can't really be accomplished in a week of talking, let alone 50 minutes, but I'll try. It's important for us, as Jonathan said, to engage with the culture we live in. God's word we call truth unchanging, but the culture around us is changing. The needs of people are expressed in different ways. The blind spots are in different areas of our lives. The things which we think of as evil come somewhere else on the list of all possible evils. And things which a previous generation thought of as good are now seen 
as compromises. We live in a perplexing and confusing and, above all, a fast-changing world where the rapid pace of change dislocates one generation from another because the assumption of the newest generation is because of the rapid pace of change, the wisdom of the previous generation is not applicable. And it is the rapid pace of change that leads ultimately to the generation gulf in a world which desperately needs the older generation to mentor and befriend a bewildered younger generation. How are we then to understand this world that we live in? I want to talk about five tensions that exist in our world, which it's important for us to understand if we want to engage with it effectively. I'm convinced that many people that I talk to day in, day out, whether it's in the media or politics or whatever it is, just don't understand what the church is saying. They genuinely cannot hear it. And many of them say they don't believe the church has got any message. Why? What kind of world do they live in? How do they see things? I want to start by asking you how you think of the various worlds that we have lived in as a civilization. I don't want to go right back to Egypt and the Old Testament, maybe just as far back as the medieval world. I like sometimes to think of the different worlds we live in as games. And I think of the medieval world as the game of chess. Everything in its place, everything in its strata, the pawns, the bishops, the knights, the kings, the queens, the rooks, all in their place, all got their separate moves, all about strategy and power, willing to give up pawns for the power of the monarchy. A feudal game of power, highly structured. And when I think of the modern world, I think of the game of monopoly. Progress through accumulation, and when my children are playing it, a little bit of ruthlessness as well. Oh, come on, sell me that hotel. I haven't got any hotels. No! <laughs> I've got the hotels. I've got the money. You're losing. Progress through accumulation. And many of us have been brought up in the modern world in which to progress through life is to end life with a whole bundle of things and status and titles. But one of the things I want to say this morning is that we are moving on from the modern world. Generations to come will look back at the modern world like we look at the medieval world and they'll have a different name to call themselves by. And we are a culture in transition between the modern world and the world that is coming and which many of your young people, your sons and daughters are already living in. And we haven't given a name to that world yet, and so it's called after modern or post modern. Because when you put post in front of something, it means after. A world of media and entertainment, a world of uncertainty, a world where people are not sure who they are, where one million people are in therapy at any one time in this country. What kind of game do we call the post modern world? Well, I think the lottery. The lottery, where superstition rules okay. It could be you. It never is, though. And where you've got a bigger chance of being killed crossing the road to buy your ticket than you have of winning it. <laughs> the lottery. People desperate to get somewhere in life not paying any cost except one pound for the ticket. The lottery summed up in a quote from Clifford Longley recently, very good quote, Western civilization suffers from a strong sense of moral and spiritual exhaustion. Having constructed a society of unprecedented sophistication, con convenience and prosperity, nobody can remember what it was supposed to be for. We live in a sophisticated world 
which nobody can remember what it's meant to be for. And our job in mission is to make Christ visible for a world to whom he is invisible. That, for me, is the essence of mission. We may think we live in comfortable times, but all you've got to do is change the tangent of which you come on our century to be shocked. For ours has been the bloodiest century of all. More people have been killed in war in this modern, sophisticated century than in 5,000 years before combined. I don't know whether you think of the medieval world as the bloody world. Forget it. Our world is the cruel, violent, and bloody world of the whole of human civilization. It is a world in which even in the last few years, in the, 18, in the 1980s, 8% of the rainforest, the lungs of the planet, disappeared. An area three times the size of France, just gone and not renewable. Many of you older people may have been brought up with natural uncertainty, earthquakes and whirlwinds and volcanoes, things that were more powerful than you were but had nothing to do with you. They came from nature, as it were, and they were natural uncertainties. But your grandchildren live with manufactured uncertainty. For we have changed the world that we live in. The things which are a threat to the world now, the acid rain, the desertification, the global warming, the things that are a sword of Damocles over the future of our planet have been made by us. They are the costs of industrialization, of consumption. Does our world have a future? You don't have to be a Christian prophet to say it has an uncertain future. So this generation are facing things which no other generation had to deal with before. We literally do not know what will happen next. In the context then of these, this uncertainty at the end of the millennium, how do we approach our culture? Jonathan said it's very important to do this. And one of the reasons for us is summed up in that little proverb, a fish discovers water last. The things that are most close to us are most invisible to us. Because a fish breathes the water all the time, it's not aware of the water. And some of the things that have most power over us are the things we take for granted, the things we can't see. And it's true sometimes of us in the church, as it is of people outside the church. So it's important for us to make our culture visible in order that we might be able to address it effectively, to engage with it, and conduct a effective mission to it. Five tensions, then, in this world that is on the move, this culture that is on the move, and I've already mentioned one of them, from the modern world to the post-modern world, the world that's coming. You see, the modern world, the world that we're aware of around us, came out of the last 200 years, maybe, some would say much before that, of the rise of science, the rise of the idea of the individual, I think, therefore I am, as Descartes said, and a sense of confidence that we had come of age. We were no longer journeying towards a world that was coming, but we had arrived. We no longer needed a reference point in God which gave meaning to the whole world. We were our own self-reference point. And it is this modern world which has given birth to so many great inventions and ideas. The cleverness of the human race has been amazing. 
But as I said before, the violence, the environmental decay has been a high cost. And the highest cost of all has been the removal of that umbrella, that sacred canopy over the whole of life, represented by the worship of God. No longer does everything in life refer to God as it did maybe in the medieval times, where a debate on the rate of interest was a debate about theology. No, now religion is an optional extra, a marginal activity for those who prefer to go to church than to play golf on Sunday. So the modern world was a world of confidence, of optimism. We can do it. If there's a disease, we can provide the cure. If there's a disaster, we can rebuild. There is nothing that we cannot do on our own. But this modern world has given rise to all the horrors that have beset us. And since the First World War in particular, there has been an increasing uncertainty about whether it's been worth it. And a pessimism, a lack of confidence, a sense that the modern world has let us down. And in our young people today, it's seen in the sense of irony and satire, the sense in which the authority of scientists and theologians and philosophers are called to account and their authority is not recognized. The sense that those of us who have built the modern world have borrowed resources from the next generation and have let this generation down. So there is a tension then between those of us who still live with the confidence and optimism of the modern world, building structures, not knowing what they're there for, finding cures, but finding problems as a result of the very advances we make. The second tension is between the global and the local. You see, the state of the nation is almost an old-fashioned concept, because the nation as an idea is disappearing. The nation is given its identity by the boundaries around it. And it says, within these boundaries, we are British or Welsh or whatever the boundaries are that we're looking at. And outside, in another set of boundaries, we're French or we're Australian or what have you. But we live now in a global world in which the media, the movement of trade, tourism, and the fast-flowing markets of stocks and shares and capital around the world are connecting the world up so that we are an interconnected world. And this world means that you may be driving a car which was uh, made on the other side of the world but has a familiar British badge to it. You can buy exotic produce which for formerly were only Bible in season, now all season round, so the seasons have lost their meaning as far as cooking is concerned. Soon, in the next 10 years, you will be able to phone Japan for the price of a local call. The whole world will open up in telecommunications. I can work on my computer here in my room at uh, Keswick, and plug into the phone socket and work on a computer in Peru, as if I was sitting at the computer myself. I can speak to people via a video camera and see them on the screen who are in Australia. I can type in one word. I typed in the name of a drug the other day that I was interested in, uh, a medicinal drug, not a hallucinogenic drug. Um, <laughs> Uh, and a uh, hundred articles came up on my screen. The Information Society is connecting us all over the world. The problem won't be a lack of information. Those of us who are brought up on leather-bound volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica, who wanted to do our homework, and our parents would say, look in the encyclopedia, and it was never there. And if it was, it was 10 years out of date. We'll just say, Oh, go and dial up the internet. 
and you'll find there maps and biographies and all kinds of things that you need to do your work. The global world has behind it a sting in the tail because it says this, all cultures are equal. That is the price of what is called globalization. There is no argument for being a superior culture, whether it's China or Russia or Europe or whatever, all cultures now are considered equal. And if all cultures are considered equal, the sting in the tale is that all gods are considered equal. In Norman Davis's new wonderful book on Europe, if you, are, if you read it carefully and you ask yourself the question, what was it that gave Europe its identity? It was Christianity. And yet we live in a world in which to claim any superiority or authority for one culture or one faith is deeply offensive. All cultures now are mixed. The coca colonization of the world has progressed. The McDonaldization of the world has progressed so that you can walk, as I did recently, through a Cairo uh, slum and see Coca-Cola signs swinging in the breeze. More effective sometimes than Christian mission. And all cultures are mixing up what is English cooking anyway. I know what Indian cooking is. What is English cooking? We've got access to all kinds of cooking and programs and all kinds of things, so we're a mixed culture. And some of us are mourning the death of English culture, but we are mixed. John Redwood says, the politics of tomorrow is the politics of identity. And I think in that, at least, he is right that we are people who feel that we are losing a sense of identity. And one of the reasons for many of the tragic wars around the world is this loss of identity, that our culture has been eroded, it is mixed, all cultures are seeping into one another. And what is happening is that people are feeling insecure and they are reverting back to the old tribal patterns. If you ask what was wrong in Bosnia-Herzegovina when that artificial country of Yugoslavia broke up, it was that people could not accept the artificiality of the compromises that had been put upon them for so many years. And they went back to the old tribal conflicts. Part of that in Rwanda as well. All over the world, there are new tensions between old, and the old grievances, the old wounds are opening up because people are looking for a sense of identity. There are good things, of course, in globalization. There's tremendous choice, as I said, in the supermarket, tremendous choice in the goods that we can buy. There's tremendous freedom to travel the world and see it. There's not only bad there, but there is confusion. And one of the great uh, philosophers of international relations in Harvard University looks to the 21st century and he says, what will be the cause of major war in the 21st century? And he says, it will be the clash of civilizations. In this world, we have the great power blocks of our day, which are no longer represented by political ideology. The left-right divide, as far as I'm concerned, is over. It is no longer important in our world. What is more important in the world that is coming are the clashes of religious ideology in our world, the clashes of civilization, the great secular civilizations of China and Russia, the great clashes between Islam and Judaism, Christianity. These are the fault lines of the 21st century. And the generations that come will have to deal with them. And if peace is to come, 
in the next world and not to become again a place of religious violence, then we need people who understand the world's civilizations and the world's religions and do not hide from them. You see, China is the biggest economy by the year 2020. The league table in the year 2020 will go like this. Top five economies in the world, China, US still holding on by its fingernails, Japan, India, and Indonesia. Those, brought, those of us brought up in thinking of India as a poor country to which aid should be sent are amazed to find that by 2020 it will become a major industrial power. The world is changing. The days of the West and the rest are over. Many of us thought of ourselves as those who were developed and we made phrases which described the rest of the world like developing, catching up with us. But some of the must have, many people in the world are not bothering to catch up with us. Japan is a modern society, but it has no Christian base. Many societies which are passing us in terms of economic and political power have philosophies driving them which are foreign to our way of thinking and we need to understand them. The rapid pace of change, well, let me give you one measure of it. In 1962, South Korea had an income per head, a GDP per head, like the Sudan. It was that far behind. Now, South Korea rivals the richest countries in Europe the change that has happened in the last 35 years has been enormous. Commentators say the, 20th, the 21st century will be Asian, not European. And our great need is, uh, is to understand Asian culture because just as we colonize the world with Coca-Cola and McDonald's and our industry, so Asia will colonize the world with its own concepts. And we desperately need people like Vinod Ramachandra in Sri Lanka who understand the relationship between Christianity and Hinduism or Buddhism, the culture of the East. When I went to Africa, I was amazed to learn that the average age of Kenya, for instance, and of people in Nairobi was 14. But the average age of people in this country is around 43. And our culture is so often middle-aged. We have a graying population. But in Nairobi, most of the people are adolescent. And the energy and the enthusiasm and the problems are the problems of a teenage culture. So there is a tension then between the global and the local. That some of us feel threatened by this massive expansion the connectedness of the world, and we're trying to build walls around the local to find a new identity. And yet we need people who can understand the world as an entirety because we are so connected. So from the modern to the postmodern, from the global to the local, and thirdly, tradition to choice. <clears throat> we live in a post-traditional society. That's not a society in which tradition has disappeared, but a society in which its place has changed. Many of you uh, will have been brought up in a traditional society, if you're an older person, where your place in life, the kind of person you would marry, the kind of job you would do, maybe were more given than they are now. And there are still cultures in the world where uh, your tradition uh, takes a lot of the strain of making choices. But in the society we live in now, it is a society based on freedom, and a very special kind of freedom, a freedom measured by choice. The more choices you have in our world, the more free you are said to be. We have the phrase from the Thatcher period, 
free to choose the new freedom. I want to talk a bit about consumerism in a moment, but I believe that too much choice can lead to anxiety. I said that we live in a world in which one million people are in some kind of therapy or analysis today. We live in a therapeutic society. Another quest for identity, looking for the self. No longer the, the person sitting in the pew, the preacher assuming that this person has a massive ego and they are rebelling against God. The assumption of so many Victorian style preachers, but not true of our society. The person sitting in the pew in 1997 feels a sense of inadequacy. In the Victorian era, you would rail at them with judgment, trying to temper their ego and their rebellion with the knowledge of the power and the holiness of God. We still need the power and the holiness of God. But many people in our society today are on a search for the self. They feel inadequate. They feel they have nothing to contribute. They feel that they are powerless with respect to the problems of the world. And when they are told that they are sinner, which they are, they add it to the list of their own burdens and go away, sometimes not knowing of the saving power of Christ. Our society needs the preaching of the love of God like no other society has done. To understand the love and the mercy and the salvation of God for themselves. Because we are an anxious society. I was filming uh, with the BBC a couple of weeks ago here, Long Meg and her daughters. I don't know it's a, if you know it, it's a circle of stones. I was doing some meditations for them. And there were lots of people sitting in the circle doing rituals in a kind of covert way. Behind one of the stones, we found a ritualistic binding of different colored wools which had obviously been used in some symbolic ritual. We are a, sim a superstitious society, an anxious society, wanting to find our place, but no not knowing what it could be. And so the freedom of choice that we have has brought anxiety and not freedom. And the tradition which the Christian faith is and has become, says that there is something which previous people have discovered which is relevant to you today. The opposite of the idea that rapid change dislocates the world. A sense that the things that matter have been discovered in Christ and portrayed in the Bible and passed down as received wisdom from generation to generation. So the elderly of today have got something to tell young people. The thing is that people do not accept tradition in the way that they did. Unquestionably, unquestioning because it has been proved true by a previous generation. Tradition has become another choice. I can choose to be traditional as one of the many choices I have. But there is a problem. Because in this world of uncertainty, in which anything goes, in which morality has become a lifestyle issue, there is a new and ominous search for power and dogmatism. And the thing which I fear in the 21st century more than anything for my children is the rise of fundamentalism. The thing that awaits us, the thing that is brewing in the wings is fundamentalism. By this I do not mean the word which many of us will hold as precious which is the taking of the Bible seriously. I mean a dogmatic conviction that I am right and that you are wrong. That the truth that I have 
is so true and so unpolluted that it gives me the right to ignore what you believe. I do not have to be open to dialogue. If I evangelize, I do not have to listen to those who are talking to me because I have the truth and they do not. This kind of fundamentalism, which is brewing in every religion of the world, is a reaction against the breakdown of authority in our society. A reaction against the liberalism and the consumerism of our day, which says anything goes. As long as you feel fulfilled, anything goes. And it is an attempt to bring back authority and structure and order to our world. But the road it leads down is the road to violence. If I am right and you are wrong, it is a short hop to say I am good and you are evil. And it is a shorter hop when that is said to saying I must survive and you must be destroyed. Rabbi Shem Stalba, one of the Jewish rabbis of the US, in a recent article in Time magazine says suddenly it's almost sexy to be a religious fundamentalist. The right to impose your views on others. I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian all my life, but I have no right to impose my views on other people. I have the right to persuade them as they have the right to persuade me. I have the right to preach and worship freely, but I have no right to impose or manipulate or exploit. Politically, we live in a democracy. And there's a very good set of Christian reasons <clears throat> why democracy is sometimes a good kind of society to live in. You know Winston Churchill's old proverb that it's the worst form of government except all the others that have ever been tried. Richard Newhouse, the American thinker, said once that democracy is the appropriate kind of society, the appropriate kind of government in a fallen world in which nobody, including the church, can infallibly speak for God. It's an expression of humility in which all persons, all institutions are held accountable to what he calls transcendent purposes imperfectly discerned. Of course it's unsatisfactory. Only the kingdom of God is satisfactory. And we grumble about it and we mutter about it. But the very grumbling we do and the discontent we have is a sign of a healthy society. We are free to criticize our politicians, free to hold them to account, free to say this isn't the kind of world I want to live in because we know that there is only one world that is coming that is a world in which we'll be fulfilled, in which righteousness and justice will prevail. Okay, we want a perfect world, but that world is the kingdom of God. And the longing and a hunger for the kingdom of God is dangerously misplaced when we try and create it for ourselves in this world. And history shows us that when Christians, instead of pointing to the kingdom of God that is coming and is perceived by faith in Christ, try to build it out of political building blocks, it can quickly lead to either fascism or communism. There is no such thing as a perfect world before the reign of Christ in the new world. And we live in tension between the already and the not yet of the kingdom of God. In a history which is the history which witnesses to compromise, to the fact that we as the church 
are growing the wheat and the tares together, and the world itself is a deeply compromised world with both good and bad in it. And yet there are those who are so frustrated with the things that they disagree with in this world that they will impose their view on the rest rather than serve them with the love of Christ. The way of Christ is the way of the cross, not the way of triumphalism. We've heard it from Charles earlier this morning. So there is a problem then, because tradition, the things we valued, have given way to a chaotic, false freedom of choices which promised so much liberation to people, whether it's a sexual revolution, the technological revolution, so much promise and so much bondage as a result. Be careful. Don't let your frustration lead you away from the cross. Don't let your frustration give you airs and rights that you do not have to impose your worldview on others who you think of as lesser than yourselves. There is no such way. It is folly to believe it. That way is the way of violence. So the tension then between the modern and the postmodern, between the global and the local, between tradition and choice, between fourthly truth and power. You see, the very truths that we believed in have been eroded themselves. You know and I know that we live in a religiously plural world. When I was doing my piece to camera in Long Meg and her daughters, I, was, I could actually say the words. I've even remembered my lines. I usually forget them, but I've actually even remembered my lines. I was talking about the growth of pagan, uh, paganism and witchcraft in our society. Recent report says that there are over 250,000 pagans and witches in our society. And as I uh, was saying this, I think I did it about 13 times because I forgot what I was saying. I had to go back and start walking behind the stones again and doing it. Dennis Norden would have a wonderful time with me with the outtakes. There were some people massaging each other's shoulders in a kind of very meaningful way by one of the stones. And I was speaking so loudly, the crew were doing something as they do over here, and one of these guys came up to me and he said, what are you doing? I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> oh, I said, we're, we're making a television program about Longbeg and her daughters. Are you just covering the sacred sites? He said. Um, no, I said, just we've done Hadrian's Wall as well. He looked at me quite threateningly, actually, and walked away very slowly. For this was a sacred site. For me, it is a site which celebrates dark powers, nothing to do with holiness. But for him, as a new ager, it was a sacred site. And everybody's into spirituality. It's the new word at parties. If unlike Jeremiah, you go to them. If you want to talk your head off at a party, you can talk about spirituality till the cows come home. Because spirituality, like culture, is equal. All spiritualities in our world have become equal. Somebody is into astrology, another is into crystals, another is into psychokinesis, or whatever it is, the list goes on and on and on and on. All these things are worthy of respect, we are told, in the new age. We are the age of false tolerance. We are told that tolerance is the greatest virtue in our society. 
But tolerance is only a virtue in a society in which people have commitments. And the postmodern world has no commitments. It is because I am a Christian and I believe that Christianity is true and that Christ is God that my tolerance means something. But if I believe that what I believe is no more important and true than anybody else's beliefs, then it's not tolerance, it's indifference. And our society is at its most vitriolic where Christians claim not just that Christ or Christianity is true, but it is the truth by which all other claims to truth are judged. In our society, that is the most offensive thing that you can claim, especially with liberal people. So, for instance, you'll be invited maybe to dinner or supper or tea or whatever it's called in your part of the world with people who are not Christians. And they will ask you to say grace, often before the meal. And here is you, coming, having come back from Keswick, all fired up about mission, thinking, what an opportunity to witness for God. In my grace, I shall give them the gospel. But what are they doing? They're saying, this is your truth. We would like to be polite and gracious and recognize that we are decent people. We're not intolerant people. We know that you're Christians and we know that Christians say grace. So we'd like you to say grace because you might feel more comfortable. But it's your truth. It's not our truth. You see, in our day, there is no such thing as the truth anymore. There is your truth, and there is my truth. But there is no longer the truth. Truth is not universal in the postmodern world. It is local. You hear young people saying Christianity is all only spreading all over the world because it went with the power of Europe. It went with the colonialization of Europe. It should have stayed a local story. But because it rode the power of trade and political colonization, it has spread outside its limits. You hear in sociology courses around the world the fact that the big stories have let us down. The big stories of communism big story of feminism, the big story of Christianity, anything that starts off the meaning of life is dot, 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 is no longer true by definition. Because in this world in which we live, there is only your truth and my truth, and they are equal with one another. The second thing about this is that truth and power are seen together. You see, if I make a claim to my view of the Christian faith being true for everybody, as I do, because I believe Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation, that is seen to be a bid for power over people. All truth claims are seen as power bids. This is difficult for us as Christians. And if it continues, we'll make Christian witness a very important but difficult thing. Because all views are equal in the world in which we live, because nobody's got any claim to superiority, because tolerance has become an empty virtue, then to claim that Christianity is true for everybody, that Christ came to save the world, is seen as a bid for power over people who don't believe it. And this means that Christianity is held up to suspicion. People, younger people in particular today, are suspicious of claims. 
Be careful what you claim. Because people are looking for the evidence. It's very easy on a platform, in a meeting, to make claims for the Christian faith. One of the reasons why Charles Price's tape is one of the tapes I'll take back with me this morning is he put the other side. That God's plan is good for God. It may not be good for you and for me. Our life may be a life of suffering, a life of difficulty. Let's not try and turn the gospel into a public relations exercise for the Christian faith. Our claims are under the spotlight. Tony Thistleton, the great theologian, professor of theology at uh, Nottingham, one of the most eminent theologians in our country, says that Christian love must be non-manipulative love. If our methods as Christians are suspect, we live in a world which will find us out. If we claim great healings on a platform somewhere, which are claimed during the meeting for their spectacular nature, but cannot be verified afterwards, then we are under suspicion of manipulating people. In other words, the world we live in, thankfully, by its confusion, by its problems with truth, by its suspicion of power, brings us to the heart of the cross itself. Because in our age, the things which we need to display, so important in Christian witness, is the servanthood of Christ and the life of the cross. Tony Thistleton says this, the claims to truth put forward in Christian theology, therefore, call for love where there is conflict, for service where there are power interests, and for trust where there is suspicion. In a world where there is no trust, we need to build it. In a world where so many messages are based on their bid for power, we need to give up power and become the servants of others. In a world where conflict and power interests collide, we need to love our enemies. In other words, we are under pressure from a society that frankly disbelieves us to live the gospel. What the world is looking for are not great claims, not wonderful excitement, but authentic Christ-likeness. The people we are going to with the gospel are described by Zygmunt Bauman, the great Oxford philosopher, in these words. They are vagabonds and tourists. He says this, what keeps them on the move is disillusionment with the place of the last sojourn and the forever smouldering hope that the next place that he's not visited yet, perhaps the place after the next, may be free from faults which repulsed him in the places he's already tasted. And then he says this, it's a great quote. Pulled forward by hope untested, pushed from behind by hope frustrated, the vagabond is a pilgrim without a destination a nomad without an itinerary. It's a great quote. P pulled forward by hope untested, pushed from behind by hope frustrated, a pilgrim without a destination. That's so true of the world we live in. People going from one thing to another to give them meaning. This week it's the diet that's going to take three stone off them and make them beautiful. Next week, it's the vibrating crystal in which the powers of the age will tell them what to do. The week after, it's the astrology column. They are on a search for meaning and identity and 
purpose in which they are vagabonds searching in the dustbins of life, pushed forward by hope frustrated, pulled by hope untested. A pilgrim without a destination. In this world, we need, as never before, my time is drawn to an end, to bring the truth of Jesus Christ as lived out in the people of God. Doctrine is not enough. Words are not enough for this generation. They are suspicious of words. They've had it with ideology. What they want is to see the distinctiveness of a life that is not based on bids for power, that it does not get its identity from conflict, which is trustworthy and has integrity and reminds them of the person of Christ. The last tension, which I've got no time to go into, which I'll talk a little bit tomorrow, is the tension between consumption and meaning. Because meaning has been divorced from messages and is now attached to things. The, the job of the advertising and marketing industry is to attach meaning that belongs to the spiritual journey to a pair of jeans. To say, if you buy this, you can be a changed person because you can go from being this unlovely person to this accepted, beautiful person. In this world, having has replaced being as a mode of identity. In this world, what my grandfather called debt is called credit. And where he would be told he was foolish to wait five years to get married, to save so he could pay for what he owned, because now you can just put it on your credit card. Access takes the waiting out of wanting. A world in which we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, we're very uncertain about tomorrow, we want it now. Give it to me now, I'll pay for it later. A world where at the end of life and we face the final frontier, to borrow a Star Trek analogy, of death, we found ourselves deluded with all our things that we cannot take with us. So here is a mapping exercise then, this morning, of the culture we live in, the tensions that we live in. It's so difficult, isn't it, to understand this fast-moving culture, to be prophetic in a way which is effective and accurate. But I want to encourage you and to say that if we can understand the world, if we can listen and be humble and open and yet committed to Christ, there are still people out there who are hungry for the word of God. Don't be discouraged. There is good soil out there for your words to fall on. But so often the people who are hungry do not understand what we are saying because for them the map of the world is different to the map 40 or 50 years ago. So as we go to them, and as we leave Keswick later this week, in our humility let's remember to listen as well as to speak so that in understanding the signs of the times, we might bring them a message about the Lord, who is king of our times. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we offer to you the small offering that we have, the loaves and fishes of our words and our lives. We live in a suspicious and cynical and ironic generation. Oh God, help us to give up our bids for power, to take on the non-manipulative love that is crucified to show the world what God is like. To give up power, to be a servant of all, that they may see in us Christ and him crucified. Amen.
Thank you. Well, we do want to thank Roy for that deeply thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, it is on cassette. If you would like to take it with you, you can order it at the ICC stand. Thank you, Roy, very much indeed for that uh, prophetic word to us. Please be here tomorrow for part two when we look at the state of the church. Thank you and have a good afternoon.